Hey, what's up, buddy? How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I know we uh, tried to make this work well last week, but uh, technology got the better of us. Yeah, a little bit of those audio issues, but it uh, seems like we got it going, going it's now. A, it's so funny. It's like I, I, I talk to people. I'm like, you know, it's 2019. There should be no technology issues regarding the internet and getting a podcast up and running, but we deal with it nonetheless. Yeah, you should see the uh, even connectivity issues with audio on the International Space Station. It's always hilarious to watch celebrities when they come into my work and they they head over to Mission Control and they speak with the astronauts. There's still that delay that kind of throws them off a little bit. And sometimes it's a little bit choppy and, and you think, hey, this is NASA, you know, there's, but you also forget that they're about 250 miles up moving at about 17,500 miles per hour. So that's so yeah. insane. I mean, you're that that's a little justifiable. I, there's this comedian, he does a, he does a routine and I can't remember who it is, maybe CK Lewis. And he said, you know, or no, I can't remember what it is. He says, just give it a minute. It's going to space, you know? Yeah. So it's like that, that patience is hard for us to deal with in this world we live in for sure. Yeah. Imagine how hard it is for the, uh, for the engineers who are speaking to the robotics that are out, you know, maybe minute delays or even further than that. Think about the Voyager yeah. that's out there. That's, you know, that's got several, uh, a good amount of time, several hours. Is that what it is? Uh, several yeah. hours to be able to connect? Yeah. Well, it's out there in the Kuiper belt, uh, the Kuiper comet belt. So it's, it's, out you know beyond the uh the orbit of pluto neptune yeah. out there that's wild and then does it just keep getting further and further at this point or it is does, that yeah so is it, that something that's not going to be recoverable correct no the in, original intention between mm -hmm. for uh, voyager one and two was uh to go send out and now you know there's debates on whether this was a good idea or not but to send out pretty much coordinates to where we are and uh th there's golden discs with sounds of earth um there's a bunch of children saying hello and welcome, and uh, there's some drawings on it. There, there's a, it's an actual record, and um, it has a bunch of music. Actually, a lot of a lot of the classical really? music and a lot of the famous stuff from the from the 70s and earlier. Um, and then it has like maps. It has the figurines drawn of what what we as a species look like. It has a bunch of information. Interesting. So, Where do you fall on that? on that thought of whether or not we should put our coordinates out into the out into the universe. I think it's you know I think it's a good idea. I, I mean, I don't see how it can go wrong. You know, the universe is so vast. It's so big um, that I think by the time if an, the, the chances of anything finding it is are relatively low. Sure. And by the time anything actually finds it, who knows if we'll even be here. If, if the coordinates to this solar system, you know, this solar system will even exist. You know, we have another about five billion years before the, the, the sun morphs into a grotesque version of itself and, and kind of inflates into this red giant and then just consumes everything i imagine yeah well we it might uh, <clears throat> it might um blow up to the uh to a radius or, or to a, a radius large enough from its center to consume here us on earth on the third planet it might not depending on its because of its size but it's always a possibility we'll definitely be burned away i mean our atmosphere oh planet, yeah so yeah, I mean, it's probably a, a fairly small percentage of growth in order for the heat to just vaporize us. I mean, it doesn't yeah. have to consume us. Just the heat itself, I imagine, would vaporize us with just a with just a, a infinitesimally small uh, growth in size, if you will. Yeah, that's all it takes. It's well, wild, man. Yeah, it, it will have to grow, uh, you know, a decent amount. It's tiny, like you're saying, in the overall you right, know Right, in the grand scheme of things, sure, yeah, sure. Yeah, wow. Well, how did you get into all this, man? I, uh, is this something that's that's been on your mind forever, or or is this? Yes. Yeah, so when it comes to like space, I I can kind of attribute a lot of my interest and passion from when I was a little kid. You know, I, I my mother she worked like two jobs to keep us fed and to keep us house, housed and everything. We were raised by a single mother, my brother, my sister, and myself. And uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to see her very often because she worked so long and so late. So at night, I would go into her room uh, before she got home and I would make her bed and I'd lay in it and I'd have the TV on. And what was playing was always Star Trek at that time of night. It was always Star Trek playing. So I'd fall asleep listening to, you know, the sounds of Star Trek. Also, I, I watched, I don't know if you remember Flight of the Navigator, which is I don't like, remember it. No, it was a, it was an 80s movie in which this. This kid sneaks into a NASA facility, and there's a an an alien space technology spacecraft that's shaped kind of like a teardrop, and the spaceship is sentient. It's actually like it, it can think, it can speak. The spaceship so he, itself. Yeah. So okay. he he sneaks in. It's every kid's dream. He sneaks into the spacecraft, 
and he becomes friends with it. And, and the actual spacecraft has different forms of life from all its visits um, all over the universe. And so it takes him on this adventure. You know, it's like a, a, like a, a stereotypical 80s like kid venture movie. Sure, sure. Well, the, the boy actually ends up leaving Earth. They go and travel like, you know, on Earth. They travel the bottom of the ocean. They travel into space. And, and um, well, he ends up coming back to Earth. And he is, has stayed the same age. And his whole family is about 10 years older. And so to, as a little kid, this didn't make sense to me. You know, I, I would learn later in life what time dilation meant and how it actually worked. But the, it always stuck with me. You know, I, I just time and space and how this happened. It just it didn't make any sense. So naturally, I had a built in curiosity as a child. And then um, I, I couple those two with with after I was a uh, uh, I got up one morning really early in the morning as a little kid. And uh, we were going on a family trip up north. A drive, a drive that we were going to start real early in the morning. So, I mean, it had to be three or four in the morning and, and there was no sun up yet. And I wasn't used to that. And I, I do remember walking outside and looking up and seeing those dots, you know, those dots in the sky and wondering what the heck is that? What is that? And so when people try to explain it to me, you know, it only feeds your, 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 your imagination as a child. So all these different things coupled with learning more and more about it as, as I got older and still today. And, you know, it's still, renders that childhood curiosity it's still one of those things that makes me feel like a kid again that's the beauty yeah. i guess of of science and astronomy and mathematics and is like you, you never lose that feeling yeah i can tell <clears throat> i can hear it in your voice which is really cool um because i think a lot of guys has, have lost that you know we 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 do what we're supposed to do right so we go to school and we get the job and we go into the cubicle and we just live yeah. that mundane, monotonous life that we aren't designed for, that doesn't satisfy us, it doesn't fulfill us in any way. And then we wonder why men are dealing with depression and potentially even suicidal thoughts. You know, and I hear you and I'm like, all right, this is a guy who like is deeply, deeply engaged in his work. He's excited about what he's doing. And that's uh, refreshing to hear and see for sure. Yeah. You know, I feel it, it feels like. And this is this might sound a little bit mean towards other uh, other, you know, maybe perhaps other people's passions or other lines of work. But I tend to look at all the other all the other types of jobs and careers out there. And, and to me, a lot of them seem cyclical in nature, like they exist for the sake of existing and they move in a circle. And very, very few of these of these, you know, careers and, and paths in life actually move upward or, or contribute in a way that that adds to that human house of knowledge or that in a tiny, you know, infinitesimally small way helps possibly save our species in the long run, you know? Mm. And, and I mean, you know, I mean, I'm sure you've read Sebastian Younger's tribe sure. when he, yeah. when, he, when he talks about, you know, the, the, the need to feel relevant, the need to feel, to feel as if you're a participant in something that actually matters. And in the book, he, 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 you know, narrows it to how it is in wartime and, and, you know, the various war, not just war, but primarily war, sure. and how people can feel useful in times of, of great, you know, terror. But, um, I always saw working in, you know, a, a, you know, the space or the frontier of knowledge of knowing and unknowing. I saw that as, Hey, no matter how small I am, I'm still a participant, no matter how, bad of a day I might have, which no, none of my days are ever bad. The worst, you know, the upper limit for my bad day is like somebody else's absolute rock bottom, you know, yeah, for, uh, yeah. for, uh, for a limit of a bad day. So, cause I always see it that way. I'm like in some small aspect, in fact, what we're, what they're doing today, um, yesterday drew, drew Morgan and Jessica, uh, or Christina Koch were doing a spacewalk, a series of about six spacewalks. Um, for replacements on what's called the uh, the IEA, the Integrated Electronics Assembly, they're doing some battery re replacements, and this is uh, this is all stuff that I've been a part of. We've we've been writing these procedures, we've been practicing and training and training and training, and and you know next month we're going to start a series of spacewalks to repair what's called the AMS, the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, that's on the International Space Station, and this is like a, a hyper um, uh, uh, particle. Uh, almost it, 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 what it is, it's a dark matter detector. So it's going to help us detect dark matter throughout the universe, get a better understanding of it. And all these little things, you know, help me help give me that feeling of fulfillment. Like where you were saying earlier, that, 
that maybe some people have lost. And I think, I think it's kind of crucial to find that, you know, to, to redirect in some small way, whatever it is in your life that, that, for, I mean, it, that's how it works for me. I can't speak for anyone else. I only have my perspective on this whole existence, but it works for me. And I think it's, I think it, it might work for others also. Well, I'm, I mean, I imagine whether they want to be an astronaut or something else that all of us have a desire to find fulfillment in our lives, right? We all, exactly. we all find that in different ways, but it seems like you found yours and that's very cool. So with dark matter, I'm curious because if I understand dark matter correctly, we can't, is it that we can't measure it, but we can measure the, the result or the impact of the matter? Is that, is that how that works? So dark matter, I mean, we place the word dark because there's still so many unknowns. Unknown, right? Yeah. To it. Uh, we do know that it it's, uh, acts as almost a gravitational force that kind of clumps galaxies, you know, local groups of galaxies, or even like, even within the galaxy itself, clumps things together. And, um, and so w w how we can detect it, this, this actual, this alpha magnetic spectrometer is, is, um, going to detect in various ways, all these high speed particles, but how we can actually detect, uh, dark matter is its effects on other things. You know, there's, mm -hmm. there's, um, gravitational lensing, the way it distorts light, the way it distorts, you know, distances between or distances between galaxies, we can measure around it and kind of get an image of it, but we just, sure. we still don't know, you know, we don't know. And that that's exciting. Yeah, I imagine that is. I mean, there's so much. It seems to me that the more you discover, the more you realize there is so much more to discover. Like <laughs> yeah. the answers that you get just bring up more questions as opposed to answers to things, yeah. I'm sure. And that's great. I, I mean, some people might find that extremely frustrating, but I, I, I like it. You know, it's talk about a sense of fulfillment. There's always going to be something to learn. Well, I, I think I imagine, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's it's the path of discovery that drives you rather than maybe the discovery itself. I'm sure discovering new things is exciting, but the path seems to be just as exciting for you. Oh yeah. You know, exactly. That's exactly mm -hmm. it. In fact, I agree 100%. I think the path is more important because who wants to be, I mean, I guess there are people that like to be satiated, but for me, that's just not in my, you know, that's not in my I, I have no interest. I mean, I do have an interest in finding it, but I have sure. no interest in ceasing the, the investigation or the interrogation of nature in order to find new and more things, because it's about how much I can contribute before I pass my time here on, you know, on earth. Um, how much can I do? It's a, you, you, I wrote this down because you, you used a term that was interesting. You said interrogation as opposed to investigation of nature. W what's, what's the distinction between the two? I mean, I think the interrogation of nature is uh, just a a more of a an in depth sussing out of the realities of nature. And you know, the the reality of of all of this is even our most even our most objective scientific understanding is still observed through the subjective nature or the subjective creature that we are. So sure. what we do is do our best in trying to you know, grab things and put it in this pot of objective reality. And then, you know, if it, if it meets all the criteria or the standards for, for, you know, in scientific rigor, then we, then we can place it in our actual reality, objective reality. However, it's always up for further interrogation. That thing, you know, if there's new evidence that might, Hey, you, you got to pull this out. This isn't actually right. And that's that, you know, that's that never ending attempt at understanding at a deeper level that that sussing out that interrogation of everything so it's never quite over you know just like you know back in the 1800s we thought or the physicists of the day thought physics was basically done you know right solved and then, right yeah and and then we we thought <clears throat> we had a you know a decent understanding of astrophysics with you know the kepler's laws and and copernicus copernican understanding and Gal galileo newton all these people and then came uh, uh, Einstein with this, you know, relativity, special and general relativity, it just like shook the foundations of what we understood. So we had to go back to the drawing board. And this might, obviously this might anger like a few of the scientists that originated the original thoughts, but this is great for humanity because look where we are today, thanks to, you know, the understanding. So I, I am excited for, I am excited about the discovery of new things, but I'm also equally or even more excited about the loss you know, the change, the new information that comes. Sure. It, it's funny that 
Because I, I think you're right. I think some people would be angry, but objective truth and discovering new information shouldn't anger anybody. Nope. I, <laughs> it, I it should be, I mean, I, I could see somebody being, maybe their ego being crushed a little bit, but outside of that, there's nothing to be angry about. It's new discovery. And even some of these people who paved the way and maybe got some of this information wrong, and I've heard other podcasts and other books and and, and read books and listened to things where, you know, maybe they got, like Newton, elements of, of some of his theories were incorrect, but yep. He also <clears throat> paved the way for a lot of what we know about much of the laws of physics that we we understand even more so now and today. Yeah, I mean, kinematics. Uh, you know, this this is the the most basic of physics 101, and it's it it still guides everything we do. We have our rocketry. We have, you know, we have calculus. I mean, calculus. You can sort of attribute it to, you know. Uh, Archimedes, in fact, and uh, in thousand years before um, the the very beginnings of it, but we have um, Newton and Leibniz and all these people that that contributed to these these monsters, these giants, and they were they were still wrong in, in mm -hmm. some of those some of their understanding. You know, there were there were limits that that when uh, when Newton reached the limit of his own personal understanding, he generally he generally fell into the trap of of using the god of the gaps theory or the god what is of the that? gaps I'm not, argument yeah i'm not familiar with that so the god of the gaps is is it's i like to the way i think about it it's a sort of cognitive closure for people who'd rather have an under uh, who rather be satiated in an idea and and it, it makes certain people feel good and so what the god of the gaps is is it's this infinite regression and argumentation that always goes back to the same thing. Hey, if I don't understand this, that's because, because a God did it. Mm -hmm. And then like a few years later, we find out, okay, this is how this happens, you know? And then what happens to that argument? Oh, well then that happens because a God did it, you know? So every time there's a gap, people will, uh, you know, people will plug that hole with this idea of a God, which is, which is fine for some people. If that's what they, if that's sure. what they need, I, I think it might crush a curiosity of a child. If you tell children this, I think we should encourage kids to investigate and interrogate instead of telling them this. And if you want to word it in a way that's like, okay, well, you know, the God that we believe wants us to understand it on a deeper, that's great. That's, you know, I would, yeah. I, I would support that argument enough that it doesn't crush the child's curiosity or wonderment. Right. But Newton, Newton fell into this trap, even though he was a giant, he still couldn't come to terms with saying, you know what, we haven't, we just haven't solved it yet, or we have, we're right. not there yet. Or if you're talking to a kid, you say, you know what, maybe you're the one that's going to discover it. Maybe you're the one that's going to be the one that actually solves this problem or under or helps us understand right. something to foster it. But yeah, I don't that's know. interesting. Yeah, because I tend to lean more towards the idea if I don't understand something, um, potentially God, right? I, I recognize His hand in all things. Uh, but that doesn't mean that he didn't use laws of physics and things that can be explained and proven to create this universe and, and the phenomenon that we experience. So yeah, I could see how somebody would say, oh, it's just this. The problem with that, with that uh, argument is that you can't prove it, and it's almost a little bit of a lazy way to just, like you said, fill in those gaps. Yeah, so it's an intellectual laziness. And one right. of my favorite, if not my favorite scientist of all time, uh, Galileo. When, when the initial, uh, when he was initially being, you know, interrogated by the Catholic Church, he 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 said something that was really smart, and he said, you know, that the the God of of Catholicism teaches us how to go to heaven, not how the how the heavens go. Mm. So, you know, he he wanted to rely on our understanding or our objective, our ability to use objective uh, observation to understand things, and not always rely on this. Because I think obviously it gets us a lot further. What did Galileo gave us so much, you know, so much understanding. Um, obviously he got put in house arrest on June twenty second, sixteen thirty three, for being a heretic yeah. until he died. Yeah. But um, yeah. Let me ask you this because I fall into the trap. I, I don't know if it's a trap so much as sometimes to me I say things like, or thinks things that some of this stuff doesn't matter, right? Some of these laws or some of these things, we experience what they are and ultimately discovering and knowing what they are don't matter. But if I think about that objectively, it's probably not true because if we do know that information, there's so much more to be explored and understood and then progress can be 
can be made from that. But I, but I assume that's an argument that you run across quite a bit, especially being in the NASA program. Like, why the hell are we doing this still? Like, we've been to the moon. Like, what else can we possibly do? Yeah, so I, I disagree with that. And in fact, we win wars because it matters. And uh, why I say that is there was a, there was a, a Soviet paper written by these, these, these Soviets back in like, I don't know, it must have been the however many years ago in the 40s. And um, it, was, it was on a, on a subject that n- and no one thought mattered in physics. It was about the collapsing of these radio waves once they interfere with, with you know, various shapes. And, and it's just like somebody studying the, the testosterone effects of a, of a, a naked mole rat. You, mo- most people be like, what, why are we doing that? But right. we don't have, but we don't understand that the same people that did in that contributed to all these things 50 years ago, 60 years ago, we've fallen back on their paper and built whole sciences like that, that Russian that I was just talking about the Americans, we built the F one seventeen stealth fighter and we're able to crush our enemies <laughs> because the, the, if you see the, uh, the angles on the F one seventeen was built by, studying this research that was done by these these russian physicists that showed that the radar once it hits it as they reflect back it kind of collapses in on itself which makes this a, a, a target uh, it hides completely the signature oh, of the radar interesting yeah so we don't we it might not be valuable to us right now but years down the line it's it's going to be valuable you know what happens if we figure out you know that naked mole rats have this this inherent defense against cancer and zero gravity and so we're like, oh, we got to study this. And then, but wait, this this in regular gravity has been studied for 40 years back in the day in the 70s. We have this information. Let's take it to space now. Oh, now it makes it. Now we see the value in it. We might not always see the value in what's being done right now or in the past, but it almost sort at least it contributes. If you think about it in a way that it contributes to the human house of knowledge, you can't go wrong. Yeah. It might seem ridiculous, ridiculous, ridiculous. But you know what? It might be useful in some someday in a way that's just that might help save us in the long run. With uh, with finite resources, though, how do you determine what is worth pursuing and what you're just not going to pursue? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, unfortunately, I would want to I would want to pursue everything. We have people who have passions in every field. You know, people are are geeky about their thing. And I love that. I love that people have their niche, you know, and they can, and I wish we could afford, you know, funding, but this takes us back to what we are. What are we? We are a higher thinking primate on this planet. Um, we are warring and warring by nature, (laughs) you know, we're territorial. We still have Mm -hmm. that reptilian portion of our, of our minds that, that counsels fear and territoriality because we, you know, that's just part of what it means to be alive on earth. You know, we still have, we still have these, these, these vestiges or these atavistic traits from our past. Um, and so that's going to be there. So I don't, I don't lie to myself either. I mean, obviously we should make better badass weapons of war because, you know, I was a war fighter for a long time also. And, right. and, uh, and you know, that's never going to leave me either. But, um, uh, to go back to your question, I don't know. I think I mean, obviously, I'm partial to like my sciences, but I'm also deeply interested in geology, study of rocks and minerals, and I love the idea of the study of chemistry. I, I want everyone to study. I just wish we had the funding to let people study whatever they wanted. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. So, pr- to, in order to prioritize, I don't know. I think that's a great question. I don't have an answer. A, I guess you just have to. Mar- you just have to market yourself well, right? That way exactly. others say, okay, well, what he's yep. talking about and what he's doing is something we need to explore better. Yeah, and you know what exists in the scientific realm? There's a really good book by uh, Brian Keating uh, called Losing the Nobel. And um, it's about the, the, I think it was about the merging black holes, the uh, gravitational waves. Uh, actually, I don't really remember. I might be mixing up two books. Okay. But he talks about all what it, what it means to all the the deception and all the backstabbing that goes on in even in the scientific realm you know if if i'm going after a nobel prize and my my specific study set, and i i study chemistry and i veer or biology and i veer sort of into chemistry instead of handing that information over to the chemistry chemists that i know i would probably trash it because you know science in america is like is a capitalistic venture and and yeah I, I'm not. I'm not opposed to it. You know, I think it obviously there's there's merit to it, 
but it's unfortunate what we lose out of it. If we could only just be like, look, you know, let's pass this information. But what would be an alternative to that though? You know, how, how, how do you see that working in a way where we could capitalize and, 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 re- uh, fund more of this research and, and what you're talking about here? Like what, well, what would be the alternative? Uh, I think we would have to change the way we, like you said, like the way we fund it, how, who gets funding if there was, but then again, I also don't know, man, I don't, I don't have the answers. I don't sit on these, on that side of the, uh, on the decision-making table. Um, sure. so I don't know if it were up to me, I would, obviously there's drawbacks, but I would, I would pass that information. But then again, I've never been in a position where I've, I've, I've been on the cusp of winning a Nobel in one department and then refusing to give it up to another because that might be the my competitor might get a hold of it and that might be what he needs the puzzle to his the piece to his puzzle that he solves and gets it before me Um, it's so interesting it's like we live in this scarcity mindset you know i i was thinking about this just the other day you know you take data and numbers you're you're a mathematician and you think well this is all objective data the pro the problem is is that all of that can be skewed all of that can be warped all of that can be misleading uh, things can be added, other little elements can be taken away, and ultimately somebody who's trying to to look at it objectively can't because they're not getting all of the data and all oh, of the yeah. information. So you're the, you're explaining my exact uh, feeling about statistics when people use statistics, whether it right. be in an argument for whatever. You already know that it's skewed. You right. already know because statistics is I don't know. I, I studied pure math. Um, pure and applied math and number theory. I didn't really study the statistics aspect and probability only because I knew it's, it's such a malleable thing. You know, if I want the outcome to come a certain way, maybe I could change a few words around, change the time of day, the demographic, the location Mm -hmm. that I do these studies, there's different things I can do. And so I don't really pay attention to statistics. Um, when people, when people use it in an argument and I don't tell them, especially on Twitter, you know, you get 140 (laughs) characters and you put a statistic out there. You're like, okay, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I've, I'm guilty of it too, look, but it, it's just funny because you, you see it and you're like, I'm not sure that presents the entire case in 140 yeah. characters. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How did you uh, switch from becoming, uh, like you said, a war fighter, you're a, you're a former Navy SEAL, over into a NASA diver now is, is technically your, your role within NASA, correct? Yeah, yeah. I work at the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory. Let me actually, before I get to that question, let me back up. So you knew you always wanted to be in the NASA program. Did you look at the Navy and the SEALs as a route and a path to get there? Or was actually, that actually, a- you know, working at NASA is just something I think almost every kid has in the back no of doubt. his head. I no never doubt. actually really, what I always wanted to be was a SEAL. I, I, a Navy SEAL was what I wanted to be. I was more mm. uh, influenced by Arnold Schwarzenegger and Predator um, than anything else I watched and rewatched and wanted, you know, wanted to, to experience that, wanted to be that war fighter, uh, uh, here in this, in, in uh, speaking as an American in my, in this time, I can speak from my own perspective only. Uh, but I feel like a lot of boys growing up have that war fighter mentality, you know, and it might be all over the world also in most places at least, but I imagine so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, we've been historically the, the, the fighters um, right. and there's a reason for that. And then, you know, there's obvious reason for, for why it was, um, the men and not the women. Um, but you'd think, you'd think it is obvious, but even that is, seems to be subject to interpretation and debate these days, but well, go ahead. I, there are, there are things that are subject to debate and I, I, I always welcome debate, but I mean, you, you cannot argue that the reason women didn't go to war was because of the, uh, the preservation of the species of your tribe. Sure. Women stayed back because they, they, you know, they not just birthed, but they nurtured and reared the children while the men were fighting. And when the men came back or if they didn't come back, there was still, you know, the hope for a next generation. So that, I mean, you, they, you can, you come can up debate with it. it all you want. <laughs> you can, yeah, you can try all you want, but there, I mean, that's at least one of right. the solid reasons why men were the were the fighter, not even getting into like physical capability or not sure. even getting into any of this, um, but that that's like my go to. Um, but yeah, so as you know, as I was growing up, that's that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to, I wanted to be a warfighter. I thought it looked cool. I thought it was you know, it was my way out. 
you know, like I said, I also, I, I grew up in section eight housing. I grew up pretty impoverished. Um, I didn't have anybody in my family that, you know, went to college. Nobody, my brother was the first one to actually finish high school. Um, in fact, my brother's three years older than me and he's been working on his bachelor's for about 19 years because he's an executive with Verizon now. And he, he's been working on his bachelor's for years, uh, like one class at a time. And right now he's in his final class. So he's about to get his bachelor's. Be Excellent. The, the second, yeah, it's, it's, uh, we're so stoked. I'm so stoked for him. Yeah. Um, but you know, this, this was my, my inspiration growing up. He, he was a few years ahead of me and actually finished high school and I'd never had anything like that. So I didn't know how I was going to get out of the, get out of, you know, being impoverished and, and, the neighborhoods that I was in. Um, but the military was the way out for me. It was an obvious way out. And so, uh, yeah, I joined and I always knew what I want to do. You know, being in middle school and high school, I, I ran track, I ran cross country, I swam, I played lacrosse. I did all the things to prepare me for SEALs because that's what I knew I was going to do. Yeah. And every, time came. Yeah. Every SEAL I've talked to has said that, has said that I've always known I wanted to do this. And somebody, it may have been Jocko had mentioned that if you didn't, always know that this is what you wanted to be, you would have washed out very, very quickly. Yeah, that's just that's with the rigorous accurate. training. Yep. Yeah. So why leave the teams then? Uh, so I, I'll be honest, you know, I'm, I'm not one to give cookie cutter responses or, 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 you know, the, the standard whitewashed responses. I was pretty disheartened on my time in. I, mm -hmm. you know, it's something I wanted my whole life. And then I get there and, you know, I got to do some really cool stuff and I'm not saying it was all bad or even mostly bad. There were, there were some awesome times and a lot of the times were awesome, but you know, there was just, I was just kind of broken hearted in the teams. I wanted to go do more. I wanted to go fight wars. I wanted to go on a fourth deployment and I had a, uh, a master chief promised me that if I got my master training specialist within one year, it typically takes two years or so, two to three years to get within one year, he would let me go on my second year for my fourth deployment. And I studied so hard. I, we were out, I was out in, in the desert as an instructor, so I had nothing but time on my downtime. And I studied for hours and hours and hours. And in about a month and a half or two months, I, I, was, I requested the oral board, and I took the exam, and I crushed it. And I was like, look, this is how wow. serious I am about wanting to go back. And he just straight up lied to me. He was like, and this was, that was just the final straw for me. I was like, I can't deal with this anymore. Like, this is, this is kind of ridiculous. I also dealt with you know, racism in the SEAL teams. Um, one of the, one of my biggest, I guess, pet peeves is when I hear other SEALs talk about, I, I can't speak for any other unit, but other SEALs talk about safe, you know, that, that common response that nobody in the teams cares if you're, you know, black or white or brown, or, or if you're gay or, you know, you know, it's just, you, you know, you just carry your own weight and do what you got to do. Like, Come on, man. I mean, maybe they didn't experience experience it, and I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. But it exists. You know, we have we have murderers in the SEAL teams. We have uh, Kyle Searden, who was the child molester, pedophile in the SEAL teams. We have like thieves. You know, uh, uh, crazy gamblers, thieves in the SEAL teams. It's just a microcosm of society. It's just sure. we have all of the same problems, just like every other unit does. So to hide about this, to hide this fact is just dumb so when when i hear people say that i kind of just roll my eyes although i never pulled the race card when i was in the teams because i know that would have meant like <laughs> it would have made meant, matters worse i imagine yeah oh real bad so i yeah. never i never i wouldn't even dare to do it but i'm just not gonna lie to myself and i'm not gonna lie to anyone when they ask like so that that stuff did exist um when i was in and um you know people just not everybody just a small few uh, small group of people didn't like me and, you know, they, they tried to make my, my experience hell and they succeeded for, for a small portion of my time in. And, mm. you know, these, these small heartbreaks after heartbreaks, I'm like, dude, I just want to be a warfighter. You know, like I, I wasn't incapable. I was like, you know, I was crushing everybody in the teams and, and PT scores and, and, you know, and O course times and all the things. And I was a sniper and I was, th so that became a problem within my first platoon being a sniper comms guy, JTAC. I did, I did all these things. I was fortunate. Um, and so that all of a sudden meant that I had an attitude problem, even though I didn't talk. 
You know, even mm-hmm. though I didn't really say much as a new guy. So people misinterpreted that as as attitude or arrogance or something like that. Yeah. Is that is that yeah, what you're exactly. saying? Okay. Yeah. So and then we would go to like shooting schools, and I would actually outshoot not just them, but the instructor staff at the shooting schools, and that meant I got hazed for it. That meant mm-hmm. I had an attitude problem. And I'm I'm telling you, man, I, like I didn't even say things, and I would just get like hazed really? for random, random. It was dumb, dude. It was it was so dumb. But fortunately, after I left my first platoon. Um, and I did my second platoon and I did my third deployment. And then as an instructor, it wasn't, it wasn't anywhere near as bad. You know, it, it was, it wasn't even bad, Yeah. but there was still other incidences that was like, you know what, this is, this is dumb. I don't. And so what I, what I found in myself was, and this goes back to our, the first conversation, how we started, I found that I was slowly chipping away at my wonderment and my curiosity and my mm. happiness and I was so afraid of that. And I wanted to do something. I wanted to get out, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I think, and I've mentioned this before, I think when you exist in a, in a, in a career type that forces you to study the seedier underbelly of human society, when you study the bad and look at the bad, as if you're like, let's say a police officer or an FBI agent who studies like, you know, like child sex rings or whatever some Mm -hmm. of the worst things you can think of sure if you study this year after year it tends to wear down on your positive perspective and and it chips away at at that wonderment um and i was afraid of that and i saw everybody that i was around 25 20 years in 29 years in they were all seemingly bitter not all but most were seemingly bitter as if they had let it get to them um and i saw myself going that way too and i i got scared you know i was like this is not really what I want. I don't want to exist like this. So I, I appreciate the perspective because you're right. That's not, that's not at all what I expected. And it's not at all what, what I would think most people would say, but it makes a lot of sense, you know, as far as oh, I think it takes a, a, a different kind of human being and I won't say bad or good, just a different kind of human being to be able to explore that world, to be able to be integrated into that negativity and the hostility and the violence and I imagine they probably have, you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, maybe even a bit of a propensity to go that way if it's left unchecked more so than than maybe the majority of the population. Brother, I think the same thing. I think uh, I do. I totally agree with you. I have, I've always said, and it's a common trope in the SEAL teams, that we are all criminals that just happen to fall on this side of the fence while mm. walking on the fence instead of that side. Interesting. And so, you yeah. know, there's a, so I agree. Completely. It takes a certain type of person. And, and I guess for me, I was for a little while that person until I wasn't until I was like, okay, until I was actually able to take a step back and see this picture of who I was. And I, you know, I was like, all right, you know, um, I don't think this is where I need to be anymore. You know, I did this thing. I, 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 achieved what I wanted to achieve. I, you know, I got to deploy with, with some of the most elite teams of the, in the U S military. Um, and, uh, I was good, you know, I was like, how do I retain, how do I go back and retain that childhood wonder? How do I ensure that I'm a joy to be around? Cause you know, when you're in the SEAL teams or in any unit, you know, you only ever really want to hang out with other people of that mindset. Sure. For me, I was real bad. I didn't want to, I didn't want civilian friends. I had nothing in common with them because I fell into that for, for a little while. I only wanted to hang out with other operators. Did um, you think you were were above those individuals or different or like what was it about civilians in your mind that you're like, you know, I, I'm not going to hang out with them? Is it just the know, relatability? Yeah, I think I don't think I was above them. It's just definitely a relatability <laughs> issue. I could I could sit on the couch. One of my favorite parts of, of one of my favorite things about other SEALs and other just operators and, and you know, military in general is I could legit invite, you know, Johnny over and me and Johnny can sit here who I served with and we can sit here and watch TV and like hang out and listen to music or watch random YouTube videos and not talk mm-hmm. and just like not talk and hang out and, right. and just just being there with each other is like is a cool is cool is we're there you know we're there and that's what it means to be there um, but I found that when I hung out with civilians, it was like, you had to be doing something. You had to be talking about something. You had to be like, you know, 
and and sometimes it just gets uncomfortable or it got uncomfortable or you're no like, doubt yeah sure like come on man let's can we just chill no, we don't have to, we don't have to talk <laughs> yeah the awkward silence right yeah well to them it would be awkward you know for yeah. for like you get like you know dudes who've been through some shit and sitting around that's that's where it's at and that's not really only that. not only shit but been through shit together yeah right? exactly like you know each other at that point yep. yeah i mean whether it's on on the smaller side of the spectrum with its with it being sports for example or in military combat on the more extreme side of the spectrum you, you go through those battles together and there's just there's a connection that's hard to describe explain or even verbalize yeah so Agreed. okay so you so you leave the seals and then and then what do you do from there you 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 start applying with nasa i know you no, had some connections no, no. you did some no, other I, things okay so i i i fell into a funk man i i fell into a real dark place because i had no direction in my life and so i i got out of the the navy and within three days i was in vegas at edc the electric daisy carnival doing every drug you can imagine really? just like i lost it i fell into this downward spiral and um yeah, and, and so that, that became my life for about a, a little over a year. Uh, I did nothing. I didn't work. I didn't do anything. Um, I just partied nonstop because, I had, like I said, I had no direction. Mm. Um, and like, like we were talking about earlier, I, I, had, I didn't really feel relevant. So one of the issues that I see that with military specifically is we tend – in the military, you tend to be over-medicated on the back end instead of – prepared on the front end so if you have like your time in the military you build bridges to the outside world in the ter in the form of going to the bars you know and getting shit face drunk and these are bridges to the outside world so when your military life falls away what are the bridges that remain going to the bars getting shit face mm. drunk you know these these you know i feel like if you if we could foster within the military you know uh anything there are there are Jocko is a perfect example. Jocko was my boss back when I was an instructor. Okay, um, yeah. Jocko was like a black belt in jiu-jitsu. He, he practiced jiu-jitsu. He was like a guitar player. He would go to shows. He would yeah. like, you know, if you're a businessman, start a business on the side and explore that. Go to school, take classes, do all these, build all these bridges to the outside world so that when this one falls off, you're connected to the outside world so many different ways that you're, you have relevancy. And, and that relevancy isn't in drinking in bars. Because that's, that's where I was. Right. That's right. That's that's where I was. And so I fell into that trap where I'm grasping for relevancy. And the only place I can find it is, hey, there go my team guy buddies at the bar still. I'm going to go back to that. Why mm. did I even bother getting out? So, um, you know, I got into bar fights. I got arrested for like battery in, at a bar. And <clears throat> fortunately, I got all the charges dropped. Yeah, I was going to um, say, because that probably would affect your nasa yeah. employment i imagine yeah. right okay yeah, yeah. it would yeah. but uh i i got all the charges dropped and and fortunately there was footage of of it and you know the, the management came down and like you know they spoke on my behalf when i was getting booked because the guy was harassing me and following me around and you know how we do we don't i don't do chest bumping i don't do like if you're just within my reach i'm just gonna hit you i'm not gonna wait and i told this guy i was like look you can say what you want about me and do whatever just stay at least two arm two arm lengths away and if you know that's all my all i'm going to tell you and as soon as he broke that i hit it i didn't even hit him hard i just hit i hit him hard enough to split his mouth open mm -hmm. and so there's like blood gushing out of everywhere so and then i end up getting arrested so my life is like you know i had to do this like internal interrogation this reflection what i want to do and I realized that I, I, I was really sick of the person that I was. You know, I went to the VA. I told them I had already gone to several psychiatrists. I went to the VA, which I, I have nothing but praise for. I think the VA for me was awesome. Um, and I told them, look, I have an issue and I have I want to have it studied or, or I want to see what I can do. And so I was like, I don't have survivor's guilt. I don't have like depression like this uh, be, concerning that. I have rage. Um, I have a real rage and they were like, their response was, well, you know, rage is a, is a, an unwanted emotion that spikes in certain times. So it totally qualifies because at first I was like, I don't think I belong here or whatever. Mm, yeah. And they were like, no, you definitely do. So I did this 52 week long prolonged exposure therapy with them. And I was on the, you know, I, I was on this, this program where, where we, you know, we, we 
kind of just re- went through some of the worst times I, I experienced in the military over and over and over again until that we was had the ca- exposure. Yeah. And okay. Some of the worst stuff until I had like a breakthrough, like four or five months in mm. and, um, you know, it ended up really helping me. And then, so that coupled with like me deciding I, I, I met with every time I would, you know, prior to even going to this, I would go get black, blackout drunk. And then I'd go home and I'd always play astronomy DVDs. I had a ton of like, I would always watch astronomy stuff and really? one, like two different friends at similar times were like, why don't you just go to school for astronomy? Like, this is what you always do. You, you have this telescope in your, in your living room. All you ever do, you know, when you're alone is watch astronomy stuff. And it never occurred to me that I could go to school. Remember I, I barely graduated high school. I had like a 1.7 GPA. I didn't know how to study. I didn't know wow. anything. I know I had no influence. So I didn't know, uh, that I could be a good student since I had no experience in it. Um, especially in math, I was terrified. I still use my fingers for, for multiplication, <laughs> division and addition terrifies me. I, hate I don't know if that, me the that, check. I don't know if that inspires me or terrifies me knowing that, that you're doing all the things with NASA. <laughs> <laughs> no. So the thing is, is that even, even my, my, uh, higher level calculus professors or my, you know, combinatorics or even the higher, higher level math, we, you know, the professors would do the math on the board and they'd, they'd show all the, you know, the work and everything. And then there'd be a problem on the side. They'd be like eight times 16 plus four. And they, they, they'd ask the students, they'd be like, oh, somebody go ahead and verify this for me because we're all bad at it. We okay. Equate, yeah. Fair we enough. Equate, we equate that with math and arithmetic is hard. I, st- I mean, like I say, and I hate when people hand me the check at a, at a, at dinner because they, you know, they know I have a degree in pure math and I'm like, that's way <laughs> harder than anything that I've studied. I'm still How does like it this. differentiate? What is it? What's the difference? Uh, I mean, I don't know. That's a really good question. I, I think, uh, conceptual, I think math, uh, okay. you know, yeah. there's, there's uh, various ways to do, to solve. So like and word f- problems at the most basic level, is that what we're talking about here? I mean, I know that's drastically oversimplified, but for for difficulties or for simplicity, I'm just saying is you're you're talking about con- concepts versus the actual math itself, right? Oh, so like in in abstract algebra, which is sure. probably the hardest math that I've ever taken, um, the hardest year of math. Um, you're you're actually working on symmetries of shapes, you know. Mm. So you're 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 thinking of math in terms of like you know, turns or uh, reflections of the sim of the shape, the symmetrical values of each side. So you're, you're thinking in different ways. You're not just like, what's eight times six plus 42 minus divided by, and then you're like, it might also just be because that's my, that was my introduction to math, you know, Mm. was frustration from the beginning. Yeah. So that could, that could very well be it. That's interesting. I hadn't I hadn't considered that, but I, I guess everybody's brain just works differently, right? Some people can see it in a linear fashion and can see those numbers and it paints a picture for them and they can figure it out. And other people, you know, like you may need to experience it, see it, feel it, turn it, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah exactly. So it's, it's everybody, like you said, everybody experiences it differently. Yeah. Um, so anyway, my, I was, I was, it was suggested to me that I go study it. And so I, I signed up for school And, um, that's when my, my journey began, you know, I, I started, I started doing what I, you know, I have this own, my own personal philosophy on how I meet my goal. And, um, I, I have this goal posts in the distance, you know, there, there, these posts out in the, in the far distance, I'm, I'm this three dimensional cubic figure and I have to push this figure to that goal. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to be a seal. That's what I want to do. Or, or I've always used this kind of method. I want to be good at math. So how do I get this to that? Well, there's so much friction because it's flat on all these edges. So I got to start chipping away and sanding and, and chiseling and turn it into a sphere and roll that sphere. So it's less friction. It's easy. And what are those edges that I'm chipping away? Well, those are all the distractions that I can list. I don't want to alcohol. I stopped drinking for two years. I didn't touch any booze. I didn't, I, I gave up all the friends. I never, I didn't step into a, uh, a bar. I refused to go into a bar. You know, I, I just gave up all the things that I noticed that were taking my attention away from what I wanted to achieve. And, uh, you know, in some aspects it can be detrimental, you know, like I, I did forego my health. I stopped working out for a while and that, that was bad. I recognize that that was bad, but, Mm -hmm. but, you know, I was able to get there faster. Um, 
Um, so yeah, I, I got rid of all those things and I, I decided to like, you know, I decided to, to change my life, you know, and, and, you know, this is where from hearing you talk, this is where you and I, I, and maybe a lot of your listeners are going to disagree, um, with the way we see the world, but I don't think humans have the free will that we convince ourselves that we have, you know, I, uh, to me, human free will for the most part is an illusion. And I think we are a product of a series of prior causes in our lives. Um, and, but do you think I want to riff on that for a second? Um, do you think, and, and I and I've heard this argument before, and I think we we probably do differ on this. Do you think that the fact that we don't understand, let's just assume we are a product of these predetermined destinies, for lack of a better term, does it make it free will because we don't understand what those formulas are, right? We don't understand what those destinies are, those scripts that we're playing out. To me, that makes it free will because we don't have the understanding of what's being played out. Uh, I don't think so because then we would have to be presented with, with every potential possible scenario. And then, and then us, we would have to be able to choose that, which we would want to go, but we, we are incapable of choosing that, which we are incapable of thinking of. So how do we choose that, which does not occur to us to choose? You know, we're only, so, so, and the reason I say this is because I remember when I was a little kid, um, I remember bringing math homework home and my sister or my older cousin, somebody older in my family was like, you know, none of us in this family are good at math. None of us are, are, are very good. None of us have whatever. And this becomes your reality. You allow it to kind of like to, to burrow itself deep into sure. your, into yeah, who I you are. And then. You know, as I as I you know grew later in life, one of the things that I that I believe, I think one of the things that makes us you know incredible species is that we, if we're courageous enough, we we move towards those things that are difficult. We move towards those things that are scary, um, uh, knowing that it's it's scary. Um, so is me, that not a is that then not a necessarily a choice? I mean, that's that's still a a choice that you're making, right? Moving into what's scary, moving well, into the only, unknown. I mean, be, that's the type of person that I am, be it genetically or whatever, and only because the introduction of other people's writings of the notion of free will. Now, I'm not a determinist. I'm not a compatibilist. I don't believe in in what's in the future is, is predetermined because I don't go any further past the present moment. I say mm -hmm. where we are, we've been pushed by how we were raised, our genetics, all, you know, all things that we actually had no control, no free will in electing. Sure. Um, yeah. Um, I agree. So, with, I agree with that. So, you know, having read this, I, I wondered why something like mathematics and physics and science, why that scared, always scared me. And, you know, it's, it's, it's really been this eight, nine year long journey of self-discovery, this attempt at trying to find out and learn why I am the way that I am and why am I so scared of, of math and why, oh, well, I've been able to identify about seven different things in these all these years about these these prior causes these tipping points and one of them was my sister like predator was you know my infatuation with seal right uh, that was definitely that, that was definitely that tipping point and and my sister saying like i i don't know if it was like my cousin or somebody um saying that we were all bad at math this this family so you just bought into that idea for so long it sounds like yeah but but identifying it after all these years and saying no that's bs like mm -hmm. that's bs that's not going to grab hold as my reality anymore uh i i now now that i've you know have been influenced by reading this other stuff i'm going to go back and erase that and rewrite a new path in life one in which i am good at math and that meant i had to start at and this is i'm not even embarrassed to say it, i had to start at what was called math 038 which was a math class that was study habits, mm. pre, pre algebra <laughs> and study habits. And then yeah. like how to open a book. And then like, man, I had to go with math 38, math 46, math, like 58, math 76, math 96. Uh, then I had to go to 104. And then I got to like pre-calculus. Then after pre-calculus, seven classes later, I started calculus. That's eighth class. Wow. And I got into real mathematics and it was because man i didn't know anything <laughs> i had no idea but like i was saying before how i removed distractions i bought like i put white 
whiteboards all over my walls in my apartment. I bought a bunch of dry erase markers and set them at every window, at every glass door, and the mirrors in the bathroom when I was brushing my teeth, I'd write formulas. So every day I stud, I woke up and I saw it in my face. I bought a glass desk to which I taped white poster board underneath so I could do all my math on it. And then when I got tired, I would stand up with my book and go to my whiteboards. So there was no excuse. And then I bought a bunch of like the great courses, DVDs, and I put my kitchen table in front of my television and I've acted like I was a student in that class and I would like just take really? notes and do it. Yeah. I, I had to. Interesting. Yeah. Cause I, it, it's, it was so, it's always been so hard for me to learn cause I never knew how to study or learn. So I, I had to give it this hundred percent because it scared me, you know? And so I wanted to attack it. I wanted to approach it and I wanted to crush it or at least try. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So then, so you, you, I mean, obviously we're just like making this seem like it was so seamless and I, I imagine it was not, yeah, but, definitely. but you get done with schooling and right. You, you, you've, you completely completed yeah. before you were introduced to, I, I think in a previous conversation you and I had, we, you, you had mentioned that you knew somebody or, or, or had some sort oh, of, Oh, you're a, talking about here at NASA. Yes, correct. So at NASA was a, a bit of a different route after I graduated from uh, Columbia in New York city. I have a buddy who's the head who for a few years was the chief of the astronaut office, the head astronaut, oh, okay. uh, yeah. Chris Cassidy. He's a SEAL also, um, like a bronze star recipient, you know, uh, saw some stuff in Afghanistan back in the early 2000s. One of the first, uh, he was old team three guy. <clears throat> well, he ended up getting accepted the astronaut class in like 2004, 2005, I think. And um, he's just another, you know, another, fr he was the second SEAL astronaut. Um, and so, he invited me down to come stay at his place last summer in August, and me and a couple of buddies of mine came down. We stayed, you know, right after I graduated, we came down. I, I packed up all my stuff, in fact, and I moved to Austin after New York City mm. on a whim, no real plan. Really? Just no job, just Sounds why not? Sounds good. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I lived there for only about three months before I decided to, like, come work at NASA. Um, and... Uh, well, I mean, I always knew I wanted to work. I mean, I knew I wanted to work at NASA for right. a few years prior, but yeah, uh, I also had to get have to get another have to finish a, a graduate degree here. And so when I stayed over at at Chris's house, I told him, you know, I want to study an engineering graduate degree here at University of Houston. And he's like, okay, well, you know, if you want a job, here we are. This is like a a, a really simple job because it's not a take home job. You don't take work home. You do the mm -hmm. job at, at, at NASA there and at the neutral buoyancy lab and then you, you know, you're done for the day. So this is, that's where I'm at now. I got hired, uh, unfortunate for a lot of other guys that have been applying for that job for four years. <laughs> is that I got right? hired, I got hired within a month of uh, actually applying of showing interest of the job. I was like, wow, Ooh, that's you amazing. Mean, you mean all I would do here is like train astronauts to do spacewalks. Right. And they're like, yeah, well you can, yeah, I, I, I'm moving up. So slowly I'll move into the environmental control systems engineering. So it's not just diving. We do a lot more than, than diving, but that's, that's one of, one of the primary jobs that we do. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's actually how I got into NASA. Uh, so now that I'm here and about to enroll into the university of Houston's graduate program, hopefully in the spring and, uh, crush this, this graduate degree in time for the next astronaut class to be picked and hopefully throw my hat in to that uh, contention and hopefully I can get picked. If not, I still have time to apply for the next one. Uh, and then how, the how often one. is it every, do, do you said, it seems to me you said every five years, is that so right? It's, it's been kind of fluctuating. Okay. It, it used to be every few years, like every two to three years. Uh, it, Lately, it's been every four years. There's mm -hmm. chatter about it taking a little bit longer for this next class, but then after the next class, maybe having them roll through a lot, a lot more uh, frequently. Um, Is that we, just due to do the the demand of astronauts relative to how many are still with NASA, or like how does that get determined? Well, you got to you got to consider the vehicles that we have that are launching from you know, continental U S we have none that are launching mm -hmm. people. We have cargo that launches from here sure. every, you know, all the time. Yeah. But right now we rent out space in the Russian Soyuz and that's costing us like $80 million a seat. Wow. Uh, but right now we have Boeing, we have SpaceX, we have, um, you know, the Starliner, we have Virgin Galactic, we have blue origin. We have a bunch who are, who are up and coming some further along than others Right. that, that we're going to be able to, to go back up. 
And so when that returns to the U.S., remember, we haven't been able to launch people from the U.S. since 2011, since the retirement of the shuttle. Oh, so, wow. Uh, yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, well, we, yeah, when we, went, when we retired the shuttle, uh, it's strange I mean, it to makes me sense. That, yeah. that some people in conversations that I've gotten with think NASA was shut down <laughs> when, but it's really, it's like, it's not shut down. It was just the shuttle right. program that was shut just down. Just the pro, yeah, exactly. Sure. Which I, I think should have probably been shut down in the 90s. I, I, I think it Why was. Why do you say that? Well, because uh, the way I like to, dis- the way I like to explain it is imagine you and I, the year is like 18, you know, 1880. And you and I are, are, are sitting on the shore of the East Coast and we, we, we have to send packages over to the UK and we're, we're sending them by ship. Every day they're taking three months to get there, three months to get back, three months to get there, three months to get back. You and I, we invent a vehicle that actually flies. It's an airplane. We call it an airplane, and it flies. And it can now fly instead of months, a few hours to the UK. And we can send our packages that way, right? Uh, we're like a UPS of the back in the day. So we, we do that for a few years, but it's it's really costly because we're the ones that are that are building the plane. We're the ones that are flying the plane. We're the ones that are doing all the stuff for the plane. A few years pass, and these smaller up and coming companies kind of take you know take flight. Also, they are they are able to build planes, so they start flying. And so, what becomes more advantageous, us to keep going or us to just rent out cargo room in theirs, and we can worry about that next big leap. We build bigger planes that not just fly us to the UK, but b- fly us around the world. So we, we, we now worry about that large leap. So that's what NASA did. Instead of worrying about take, using this shuttle, which costs billions of dollars just to go from, you know, from Florida to low Earth orbit, 250 right. miles. Right, something we've already done before, right? Uh, tons of times. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's rent out space. Let's let you know, SpaceX grow, and all these people will rent out the space for that. And we're going to worry about the next big thing. So at NASA, we have the SLS, the space launch system and the Orion capsule. And with that, we're going to go revisit the moon, Mars, asteroids. We're going to make those farther leaps. Um, So I think it was about time. We had used the shuttle for how many years? It's decades. (laughs) It was in use. I think we could have diverted funds and and started worrying about the next big leap earlier. But hey, I'm not mad, you know? Yeah. So (laughs) No, so that that, ma- that makes a lot of sense. It's just about efficiencies and economies of scale and everything else. I mean, it makes yeah. it makes a ton of sense to me. Exactly. So what? So when when do we anticipate going back to the moon and eventually getting to Mars? So right now we're looking at 2024 for the moon. Okay. Um, with the Artemis Artemis program. Okay. And, um, I'm I'm hopeful. I'm hoping it all goes smoothly. We're gonna have the first female up there, which is which is awesome. Some of these. The crew has already been selected for that and no. is already training. Okay. No, no. I mean, we are training for, you know, a, a lot of moon stuff. I'm on the, right now, the Orion recovery team that uh, that has been testing a lot of the collar systems and the recovery devices for the Orion out, out to sea. Because okay. one of the things we can do at the Neutral Buoyancy Lab is we can lower the water level. And we have these two giant wave balls that can mimic sea state conditions. You know, they oh, have these gyros in them. And so we, we put the capsule, the mock capsule in there, and we, we test what it's like. If it capsizes, how will we get it upright? Uh, how will we safely get them out if one of them's unconscious? So we're, it's not always like I'm diving at, at the neutral buoyancy lab. We're always sure. taking these data points, and we're studying even like something as little as the degree of, uh, of opening that the capsule door is. Did it, does it work better this way? You know, is the, the, are there pinch points for the hands here? Can I step on this? Mm. We're, we're, we're taking note of all these the little things that you might not even realize. Um, so we're doing, we're always doing a lot of stuff for the moon, but in 2024, we should be back on the moon, which is, is super exciting. Uh, I have my own, like my own uh, lottery, my own gamble on who, who the, the first astronauts are going to be going to be. I mean, they're, they're very heavily pushing for the first there. Obviously there's going to be guys that go there also, but who the first female is, and some of these female astronauts are just studs. I mean, is that right? My God, yeah, they're like, man. I I'm hoping like it's you know I have a few in mind that are like my favorite because they're yeah. just they're beasts in the suit. They're just smart. You will never know these people are astronauts if you were at a barbecue with them because they're that's one of the first things I notice is they're just people. You know, mm-hmm. I had my sure. housewarming party here, and I had like. I was trying to do a competition, how many people I can fit in my hot tub. And I had 24 <laughs> well, and pretty three, good. 
Yeah, three of them were astronauts. You know, there's there's a couple of doctors. They're all NASA people, and uh, and they're all just like regular people who like to like do regular things, you know. Um, but some of these, I can't. I'm stoked. Anyway, the uh, Mars mission will come later, though. Un- sure. Unfortunately, that's going to be a little while. That'll be late 2030s, I guess. I'm I'm guessing. For for a manned mission to Mars, manned and, mission to Mars, and, yeah. and men landing on Mars, is that what yep. you're saying? Foot on the ground. Yep. That to me on is Mars. just amazing. I, I'm it's I don't believe it's impossible. I just think it's a matter of time, but it's amazing to think about. Yeah, that that's it. You know, there's there's if you, there I, in fact, if you go to a NASA spinoff website, <clears throat> I think if you can Google NASA spinoffs, technological spinoffs. You can see what occurs anytime we have to move into a new frontier as humans that we've never been before. New tools, mm-hmm. new technologies. If you go to a, if you go to a, a hospital, you can see like the, like uh, like laser eye surgery, the mammogram machine, the the defibrillator, the water purifiers. All these things were as a direct result of us as humans trying to explore the moon back in the day or or whatever. So these spin out the, our cordless power drill, for example. Mm. Right. That is because of you know NASA. We had we had to move into a new frontier. That new frontier requires new technology. It requires sure. new innovation, and so that trickle down effect of technology benefits all of us. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. When we when we go to Mars, we have to figure out a way to condense food to um to how you know to how do we uh how do we rehydrate food for the long run for the long term and and these things can affect more impoverished countries. We can use mm. these cheap 3D printers to print this food type that's sustainable, you know, that can help people live. And this, this might help, you know, as it gets passed down. So there it's, this stuff is exciting all the way around, not just like going to the moon, but ha- here back on earth too. Yeah, man. Or sorry, Mars. No, I, yeah, no, it's pretty amazing. I'm excited just hearing about it. And I imagine just being in, in the operations day to day is, I mean, what a cool job, what a cool yeah. opportunity you have to do some of these things. Right yeah, on, I'm man. stoked. Well, Mario, I appreciate the conversation. I, I, I know we're bumping up against time here a little bit. I do want to ask you a couple of uh, additional questions. Great. Uh, the first one I told you was, what does it mean to be a man? Uh, this is a difficult question. It is. Know, because it is. Um, like I was saying earlier, I, I think I have a modern American understanding of what it means to be a man, but that can only be applied to me, You know what I understand to be a man. Um, like I was saying, I think even the most objective things are still subjective because we're a human species. Mm-hmm. So f- for me, what it means to be a man as it applies to me, and I'm not saying it applies to anyone else. I actually don't care what most people have their own definitions of what it means to be a man. That's great. I, I love individualism. I like that people get to define what things mean to them, especially meaning most importantly, Um, but also what something like what it takes means to be a man. And for me, I, I think, um, like I was saying earlier, understanding that, you know, there are scary things out there, be courageous and move towards those difficult things, move towards those things that are scary. Um, I think being a man means it can mean a lot of things, but it also means being ready and willing to take the fight to that wolf at the door. You know, if, when the time comes, you know, stand it stand up and, 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 you know, be ready. I think, uh, I mean, I can go on all day about what it, what it takes to be a man. Um, but, um, I don't know. I think it, that's one of the beauties. I think we all get to define it ourselves, uh, you know, right on, man. I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, how do we, uh, how do we connect with you, learn more about what you're doing and then follow your, uh, your path and your journey? Awesome. So I, I'm actually only on Instagram. I don't really have any other social media. I, I, in fact, I do have Twitter and Twitter is almost all NASA stuff. So if you're, if you just want to see retweets of NASA stuff, that's, I don't really have a, a personal presence there. It's, it's, be, that's where I go to read news about, you know, other NASA facilities. Sure. But uh, I do have my personal Instagram, which is just my first name, last name, 186, which is Mario Romero 186. 186 is not my bud's class number. Everybody always says to me, you look too young to be class 186. It's not. It's just the first three digits of the speed of light in miles per second, uh, 186,282.4 miles per second. Um, and then I have uh, my astronomy Instagram, which yep. is uh, astronomy, like just A-W-E astronomy. 
Um, and on that, I kind of just share a lot of astrophotography. I kind of mix it in with a little bit of uh, philosophy down in the caption. Um, and sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll add amplifying information on the image that you're seeing itself, or it's just all astronomy stuff. There's not, nothing real personal on there except for the quotations that I suss out for myself. Um, but yeah, my, my personal one is private. I mean, but if anybody, if as long as I see that you're like a real person and not a bot, I'm yeah, probably yeah. going to confirm that your request. <laughs> I get bombarded with fake accounts all the time, and I, I'm not a fan of having fake followers. And, and uh, yeah, so I, I generally try to screen who I allow. But yeah, that's where you can find me. Right on, man. We'll sync it all up. I really appreciate you. I, I, I want to thank you for taking some time and sharing and going down some different paths that we, we don't normally explore and talk about. I think that's valuable. I think the guys will get a lot of value from that. And I appreciate what you're doing, not only within your service to this country, but uh, your, uh, your pursuits with uh, becoming an astronaut. I'm really excited for you, man. I'm going to be following your path and, and I hope that things will work out. Um, I imagine they will based on the little I know about you and I'm excited for your future, brother. Thanks for joining awesome, us. Awesome, man. Yeah. Thank you for having me. This has been awesome. Right on.